All right, welcome to church. Glad you're here, gathering with the people of God. It's a joy to have you today. Uh, my name is Matthew, one of the pastors here. If you're kind of new around here, welcome. Thrilled to have you along. Uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and pull them out. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians today. And uh, for those of you with a fresh start Bible, it's on page 1023. 1023. Your fresh start Bible. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, that's all right. You can pick one up on the way out. We'd love to give you one. Maybe you have a digital version. You can click in the YouVersion Bible app to 2 Corinthians. We'll be there in just a minute. Last week, we started this new collection of teachings around being the radiant people of God. We are radiant people. And uh, we looked at the definition of the word radiant, which means this, sending out light shining or glowing brightly. This is what it means to be the radiant people of God. That, that radiance is this emanating of light, the shining of a light, a glowing brightly of God. And today, we're going to look at how the radiant people shine the life of God. The radiant people shine the life of God. We're, we're here to shine the life of God. Now, uh, I don't know if you're... One of those people that, uh, as you're hearing these kinds of things like, oh, the radiant people shining the life of God, that sounds, that sounds kind of great. I, I kind of like that idea. Uh, but um, I, I, uh, I, I don't know that I fit that description, Pastor. I'm not sure that I, I fit in that, that mark. Maybe, maybe some of you, uh, you, you just recently got baptized, right? You, you've been giving your life to the Lord and you've been following him faithfully in the last little bit and people are, are sitting back and you're like telling them, man, I, I'm, man God's really changing my heart. I'm, I've been loving going to church. I've been reading the Bible. I've been really uh, changing my life. And the people around you are kind of like, yeah, but have you really? Like, I don't know. Like you say you are changing. You say there's something happening, but like, I don't, I mean, I, I, come on, be real. Like for real, like for real, for real, like, no, no, it can't be, it can't be you. Cause I know you, I know, I know your weekend schedule. Come on. I know how like you like to hit it pretty hard on the weekends, lay several back, kind of cut loose. I, yeah, you can't be a church person. There's something in you. Some of you, uh, you might be here and you're like, man, I actually want to get baptized. I'd love to go public, but like, you don't understand. Like I've got to clean some things up first to try to like make it better and to get some things along because I don't want to be a hypocrite. You know, I don't want to say I'm following God, but then not quite have it all together and not quite following God all the way. The only problem is, um, you're never going to be ready for that moment. You'll, you'll never be in that place because the transformation of God is something that God alone does. But I think we all have to be willing to look at the doubts and the others who are counting on us to fail. And we have to be willing to acknowledge that sometimes haters are just going to hate. And in the words of the great prophetess Taylor Swift, you just got to shake, shake, <laughs> shake that off. Some of you are waiting for the dance moves to come out, and that's just not happening today. The, the reality is, I think there are always people in our lives who are going to look at us skeptically and wonder, are you really changing? Do you really believe this stuff? I mean, you say you're reading the Bible, you say you're doing this, you say this or that, and, and you don't really belong among those people. You don't, you don't really belong in the church. You don't really belong following God. You don't really belong in those places. And, and I'm here to remind us today that following Jesus, while it does begin with the moment of surrender, it is a process of what the Bible calls being saved. In fact, the Apostle Paul talks a whole lot about this, that there are moments of our decision and our surrender. Those are important. But salvation as a whole is about being saved. In fact, one of the main words used in the New Testament for the word salvation or saved is the Greek word sozo, S-O-Z-O, -O, sozo. And it really means this, and it's root, it means to deliver and make whole. Now, how long does it take to be delivered and made whole? Well, for the children of Israel way back when, it, it took them over 40 years to get delivered and set free from all of the, the things that had broken them from being enslaved for 400 years. They were on a journey. They didn't reach their quote-unquote promised land for 40 years. It could have taken them 40 days, 
But it took him over 40 years to get there. Why? Because sometimes there are things in us that just refuse to die. Those old pesky sins, those old ways of thinking, those old habits, those old mindsets that have to be transformed and renewed. If we are going to become the radiant people of God who shine the life of God, we need to recognize that that is a process, but it does begin in a decision. It does begin in a moment of surrender, a moment of following Jesus. And we're going to get into a moment here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 where the Apostle Paul is writing to the church about this transformation, about this change, about how do we become the the radiant people of God. And, And there are some people who are coming against Paul's ministry. And they're like, Paul, you don't fit here. You aren't qualified to lead a church. Paul, we need your letters of commendations. These letters of commendations would have been like, show us the resume, because you weren't one of the original 12, Paul, so you don't have the right to tell us the things of Jesus. I think a lot of us kind of find that. When we hear something that we don't like to hear, our first response is, who are you to tell me that? This is what was happening to Paul. They were coming against his teachings, coming against what he's done in the church. And he's looking and he's letting them know, hey, listen, I may not have letters of commendation, but I want you to know you need to look back at the fruit of this church that's been born. And you tell me if their lives that have been transformed are enough for you to believe the gospel still has power. That I I may not be qualified, but that doesn't mean God doesn't use unqualified people. Because God, throughout the story of the Bible, is always using people who seem to be unqualified, who seem to be uneducated, who seem to be lacking something, who seem to have a little bit of a before Christ story in their life that gets buried in the waters of baptism that allows them to walk in the confidence of who God is. There were these haters and doubters of the Apostle Paul saying, Paul, you're you're not really qualified to be a radiant pastor. You're not really qualified or called to do this. You didn't have any accommodations and and you you need some other people to back you. You don't have enough experience. You don't have the right pedigree. You don't have the right this. And, And Paul was like, let's take a look at what the real fruit is. Because it's hard to doubt the work of God when you see the people of God who have been transformed by the word of God. In other words, you can doubt the person until you realize that they're not a cucumber, they became a pickle. If we can throw back to the last couple of weeks. This is what's happening in Paul, and Paul is trying to communicate how the radiant people of God shine the life of God. And when people who didn't used to shine are beginning to shine, you have to acknowledge that it's the work of the Spirit. And we want to be radiant people, which means we need to acknowledge that for some of us, we don't shine very bright. But we can shine brighter as we allow the Spirit of God to transform our lives. Let's get into this text today, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 3, and we're going to read this today. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. If you have a different translation, you'll still be able to follow along, uh, but it might sound a little different. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 3, says this, Clearly, you are a letter from Christ showing the results of our ministry among you. This quote-unquote letter is written not with pen and ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. It is carved on the tablets of stone, not on the tablets of stone, but it is carved on the human hearts. So Paul's already beginning to address his haters, all the naysayers, all the people who are saying your life's not really changed, you don't really count, it's not really happening, you, it's not really working for you, Paul, it's not really working for them, and they're trying to dismantle, discredit, and say you ought to just stop. And Paul's like, no, 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 you need to understand there's something already happening, etching in the people's hearts. He goes on to say this in verse 7, the old way, uh, no, not, not verse 7, verse 4. Can't skip this part, it's good. We are confident of all of this because of our great trust in God through Christ. It is not that we think we are qualified to do anything on our own. Our qualifications come from God. He has enabled us to become ministers of his new covenant. 
This is a covenant not of written laws, but of the Spirit. The old written covenant ends in death, but under the new covenant, the Spirit gives life. Verse 7, the old way with laws etched in stone led to death, though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face. For his face shone with the glory of God, and even though the brightness was already beginning to fade, shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way now that the Holy Spirit is giving life? The old way, which brings condemnation, was glorious. How much more glorious is the new way which makes us right with God? In fact, the, that first glory was not glorious at all compared to the overwhelming glory of this new way. So if the old way which has been replaced was glorious, how much more glorious is the new which remains forever? Since this new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. Somebody say very bold. Come on, say it like you have some boldness. Say very bold. bold. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. We are not like Moses who put a veil over his face so the people of Israel would not see the glory, even though it was destined to fade away. But the people's minds were hardened, and this day, when, and to this day, whenever the old covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds so they cannot understand the truth. And this veil can be removed only by believing in Christ. Yes, even today, when they read Moses' writing, they're talking about the Old Testament. Their hearts are covered with that veil, and they do not Understand. Some of you can relate because you read the Old Testament and be like, I don't understand a word of that. That he is saying, I don't understand a thing of that. We can relate to what they're saying. But there is a possibility to look behind the veil and begin to see and understand some things that we've never understood before. Verse 16 says this. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious Image. Somebody say glory. glory. Now you got to say it like you're a Pentecostal preacher in the backwoods of North Carolina. Glory. glory. Very good. Very, very good. The radiant people of God. He says, you, are, you can be transformed into the glorious image of of Christ. How are we transformed into the glorious image of Christ? Well, last week we talked about if we're going to become radiant people, it starts with repentance. It starts with rejoicing and receiving the Holy Spirit. Today I want to pick up from that thought and let you know this one simple truth. It is the Holy Spirit who produces the radiant life. It is the Holy Spirit in you who transforms you into the glorious image of Christ. It is the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you that helps the naysayers and the haters shut their mouth. Because there's something different living on the inside of you than what used to live on the inside of you before you came to Christ. There, there's, a, there's a different spirit living inside of you now than what used to live inside of you. There is a different source code embedding and running the programming of your life. It is the Holy Spirit of God who is beginning to transform who you are. And Paul is writing and using this contrast between the law of God from the Old Testament and the Spirit of God in the New Testament, letting us know that it is now the Holy Spirit who is governing our lives where it used to be the Old Testament and the law that used to govern their lives and relationships with God. Uh, he says this, what is it, verse 9 and 12, he says, the law gave us a condemnation, or let me say it another way, the law convinces us and convicts us before a holy God. 
But it is the spirit that gives us confidence now as we stand before God. See, the law gave us a conscience and it gave us a, a, an awareness and it gave us a, a, a recognition of the conviction of God. Oh, but now that we've received the spirit of God as we've surrendered and turned to Christ, oh, now we can have confidence as we stand before God. Some of you are still cowering in a condemnation when God has given you his spirit and you need to stand with some confidence before God. In other words, you need to quit acting like the old you is still living when you have buried the old you in the waters and start living the new life of Christ in you. There's a radiance that you can see and glow and shine and, and, and portray. There is a glorious nature to where you are becoming more like the glorious image of Christ because the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. The law wasn't bad though. It was needed. I think a lot of times in the in our, in our attempt to, to glorify and honor and celebrate the life of Jesus and the life of the Spirit, and rightly so, and we love the New Testament and the teachings of Paul and the life of Jesus and the other apostles' writings. We, we love those things that sometimes we give the law a bad rap. We give the Old Testament and, and God's first covenant, the, the 1.0 iteration of the covenant, we kind of give it a bad rap as if it was like uh, pointless and useless. No, it had a point to it. Let me see if I can't throw back to a, an illustration I used at the beginning of our uh, uh, King Jesus gospel series. In the beginning was God. God created the heavens and the earth and then he created man and God wanted to dwell with man. God and man dwelt together in the garden in the very beginning with unbroken fellowship. The law of God was not necessary because man had the voice of God. He walked and talked with God face to face in the garden. But man decided to break fellowship and rebel against God and to go his own way. Now there was a separation between man and where God was. And God and man can't dwell together in unbroken fellowship because man decided to rebel and live in their own knowledge of good and evil instead of living in communion with God, knowing the voice of God. They now lived in broken fellowship. They were away from God. So God decided to create a covenant through a man, and that man was Abraham, and he decided to create a covenant. So that covenant and those laws and the sacrifices and the bloods and all of the things that the Old Testament reveals was God's way of connecting the dots to where man was separated, but now could at every once in a while reconnect back into the presence of a holy God. There was now some connection possible. The law did that. They were aware that they were rebellious. They were aware of their brokenness. They were, they were aware of their need for God, but they were also aware that they were away from God. But the goal was not a line of connection. The goal was a circle of abiding relationship that is unbroken where God could remain and be with his people forever. That's God's ultimate plan and desire. So how could he complete that connection? Oh, he would send his only son. God would once again leave the place where he was and come to where man is. And now that Jesus came to where man is, he died a death that we couldn't die. He paid a debt we couldn't pay. He was a sacrifice and became a high priest and, and presented himself before God. And now he stands before God and man, bridging the gap, making a complete circle of fellowship and communion. The Bible says that Jesus didn't come to do away with the law, but rather to complete and fulfill what the law started. The whole point of what Jesus did was to come and make it possible for man to once again live in unbroken communion and fellowship with God. Making a complete circle. He completed the loop so that you and I can stand with confidence and come boldly before God. And how do we get to experience God all the time? He gave us his Holy Spirit to live inside. And now it's the Holy Spirit that's writing the laws and the ways of God on your heart instead of just trying to follow and keep up with all of the commands. It's not that the commands were bad. They were good. They helped us have a connection with God. But the way of Jesus is better because now we can experience a connection with God ongoingly forever. 
And it is the Holy Spirit who allows the radiant life of God to shine and emanate from us because of that communion with God. And this is what Paul is trying to write about. He's trying to let you know that that so many of us don't quite understand the full connection. And the reason we don't understand the full connection is because there is a veil that is keeping us from seeing the truth. There is a veil from really understanding what God is after for us. In fact, Paul would say it this way, you were all born with a blindness because of the radioactivity of your heart heart. But the Holy Spirit wants to turn you into a radiant people instead. And he says that whenever we come to God, there's, there is a veil that comes off our eyes. Some of us, the reason we don't understand God and we don't understand his word is because we have never actually surrendered and come to Jesus asking him to heal our blindness and sin. We're just kind of trying to like find our way and we're, we're, we're coming along, we're learning some things, we're growing and that's wonderful and good. But there comes a moment where you have to recognize you're not gonna have it all together, you're not gonna understand it all, but if you wanna experience the accelerator, if you want the code that wrote the book to live on the inside of you, you have to stop and surrender and ask Jesus. And when you turn to Jesus, then the blinders begin to fall off your eyes. See, for, for many of you, uh, it was the moment where you repented and you surrendered that all of a sudden, every time you read the word, something new, something was alive. There was something happening in you and you didn't know it before. You could have read it before and it didn't work. But now because you've come to Jesus, you've turned to him. He has opened your eyes to see the truth. You're starting to see things that you've never seen before, starting to understand things that you've never understood before. You're starting to recognize the life of God that you've never had before. And we were all born with it this way. A.W. Tozer says it like this. The heavens and the earth were intended to be a semi-transparent veil through which moral intelligence might see the glory of God. But for sin-blinded men, this veil has become opaque. They see the creation, but do not see through it to the creator. Or what glimpses they do have are dim and out of focus. It is possible to spend a lifetime admiring God's handiwork without acknowledging the presence of the God whose handiwork it is. Some of us can admire what God has done and the beauty of God all around us and that God is bright, but we still don't understand it because we have yet to surrender and turn to Jesus. But when we turn to Jesus, the spirit of God comes in and begins to transform us into the radiant people of God that shine the life of God all around us. It's a work of the spirit does. And and Paul is using this language. He's talking about old covenant and new covenant. He's talking about a veil over our eyes. And then he throws it all the way back to Moses and talks about things being written on tablets and, and veils that Moses wore and how the glory of God was so bright. Like, what is it that Paul is trying to get us to understand? Well, he's trying to get us to see the brightness of God known as the glory of God. What is the glory of God? Other than a really fun word to say, like you're a Pentecostal preacher from the backwoods of North Carolina, glory. Like other than a fun word to say and we sing about it, what in the world is it? And what was Paul trying to connect with Moses and us and a veil and what is all of this that he's trying to say? Well, let's explore this understanding of what is the glory of God. The glory of God, Lewis Sperry Schaefer says, is all of his attributes added together and raised to the nth degree. That's the glory of God. R.C. Sproul says it like this, the glory of God refers to who God is, not what he does. Uh, St. Irenaeus said that it is the glory of God, that the glory of God is man fully alive, but the life of man is the vision of God. In other words, a man fully alive is a man who lives in unbroken communion in abiding in the vine of God in communion with God. That's what makes you fully alive. Let me say it another way. 
What is the glory of God? The glory of God are people who become radiant and flourish and shine the life of God and reflect the image of Christ in our world. That's the glory of God. That's the glory of God. Let me say it another way. You are designed to reveal the glory of God. Because radiant people reflect and shine the life of God. You were meant to shine the glory of God. Now, Paul is talking about Moses. Moses is uh, a man who led the children of Israel out of Egypt into uh, freedom. And we read much of Moses' story in the Old Testament in the book of Exodus. So if you have your Bibles, flip to the left a lot towards the almost beginning of the Bible to Exodus. Exodus is the second book of the Bible. We're going to go to Exodus chapter 33. What is the glory of God? Why did Moses have to have a veil? Was it because he got a little too much sun and was a little bit too red in the face and he was just ashamed of the sunburn? Come on. Some of you are like that. You go outside and if you don't put enough SPF on, you are glowing for the rest of the week. Some of us have been blessed with great, great genetics, and we can get a little bit darker instead of redder all around. I'm so grateful for that in my life. My children run around in the summertime, and I'm like, good Lord. (laughs) Y'all got some tanning going on. Some of you are jealous. Jealousy is a sin. You need to repent right now that other people don't burn when they go in the sun. What is it, this brightness, this shining? We think of sunburns. We can think of that. Sometimes we talk about uh, how, how pregnant ladies have a glow about them. All of a sudden, there's this brightness and joy and this, this radiance that seems to come. Why? Because there is, don't miss this parallel, please, please, please. There is new life growing on the inside. That's the kind of radiance, the eminence. This, there's something that you can't help contain because there is a shine and a glow because of a life that is growing. This is what it means to be the people of God, to have the life of God growing in us and it can't help but reflect and shine to the people around us. But what was it for Moses? Because he certainly wasn't pregnant and he certainly didn't get a sunburn. Why was Moses needing to put a veil over his face? Well, let's look at it. Exodus 33, let me give you a little bit of a backstory. They had come out of Egypt. And out of Egypt, God had said, come, I I want the the people of God to come and and minister and be in my presence. And people were like, nah, we're not sure we want to do that. Uh, How about we send Moses to go for us and experience God on his own? And then he can come back and tell us what it is that we missed and what God said. Because like, there's a big commitment for us to get in God's presence. And we're all too scared to pay that price. And we're not sure what it's like. So let's send somebody else to go figure it out for us. And they had done that, and so Moses had gone up and down the mountain, and while Moses was up the mountain, um, they had decided to build a golden calf and to start worshiping the golden cow, uh, because that's what they had done in Egypt, and they just kind of reflected back to what they were, and old habits die hard, including the things that you worship and give your affection to. And so they started to worship a cow, and and this golden calf that they had built, and it was a bad news situation, and and God was was coming out and said, that's not the way that my people are supposed to be. My people are supposed to be in my presence. They're supposed to be with me and emanate life from that place. And Moses was at a place where there was something that God was calling him out of and to experience and needed to give instruction to Moses for his people. And actually, if you, you kind of read into it, God was a little uh, not okay with their worship of other things and the rejection. He was not okay with it. And you find this snapshot of what was happening in Exodus 33. You can go read chapters before and after if you want this week, but let's go to Exodus 33, start in verse 7. This is what, this is what Paul was alluding to. It was Moses' practice. Oh, I love this phrase. It was Moses' practice to take the tent of meeting and set it up some distance from the camp. And everyone who wanted to make a request of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent of meeting, check this out, all the people would get up 
and stand in the entrances of their own tent. They would all watch Moses until he disappeared inside. And as he went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and hover over its entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. When the people saw the cloud standing at the tabernacle of the tent, they would stand and bow down in front of their own tents. Inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Afterward, Moses would return to the camp, but the young man who assisted him, Joshua, son of Nun, would remain behind in the tent of meeting. I love that about Joshua. It goes on to say this, verse 12. One day, Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, take these people up to the promised land, but you haven't told me whom you will send with me. You have told me, I know you by name, and I look favorably on you. If it is true that you look favorably on me, let me know your ways so I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. If you have a paper Bible, underline that verse. And remember this nation is your own people. The Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses. I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. Then Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. How will anyone know that you look favorably on me and on me and your people if you don't go with us? For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. The Lord replied to Moses, I will indeed do what you have asked, for I look favorably on you, and I know you by name. Moses responded, then show me your glorious presence. Most translation says God... Moses looked to God and said, God, show me your glory. Here's the Lord's response. I will make my goodness pass before you. And I will call you out my name, Yahweh, before you. I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. But you may not directly look on my face, for no one may see me and live The Lord continued, look, stand near me on this rock as my glorious presence passes by. I will hide you in the crevices of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and let you see me from behind, but my face will not be seen. If you keep reading, you'll recognize that from that moment on, Moses' outward countenance was so bright and shining. It was like high beams coming in, like LED high, high beams coming at night, and you can't see nothing but them high beams. So he put a veil over his face so he could interact with people. But when he was with the Lord, he would take the veil off and uncover his face, and the brightness of God would shine all Around What a crazy, crazy thing. I, I want to point out a few things about Moses. Moses was an intercessor. What, what do I mean by that? Moses went, stood before God on behalf of other people. Moses leveraged his relationship with God for the good of other people. This was Moses. He went face to face with God and he took other people's needs, other people's requests, and he brought them before God and represented them before God. He interceded for people. And what God did in Moses wasn't just for Moses, it was for the people. (laughs) He would go for them. Friends, can I let you in on a little secret? What God does in your life isn't just for your life, it's for other people. It's so that the presence of God that abides in you isn't just in you making you better, but it's in you so it radiates and impacts others around you. What God does in you isn't just for you, it is for the people around you. You and I can go before God. Moses got to see God face to face, and Paul already told us that like Moses, we can go boldly before God ourselves, and we don't need a veil 
We can experience that on our own. We can go directly to God ourselves. You don't have to have someone else go to God on your behalf. You can go to God on your own behalf. And you can go to God on behalf of other people. Moses was an intercessor. Moses was also a deliverer. Moses was also the leader of his people. Moses was a priest and, and, and shepherded people. But Moses was a foreshadow of someone else who would come as a deliverer, as a shepherd, and as an intercessor. Does that describe anyone else that you can think of in the Bible? His name is Jesus. Moses was a foreshadow. In other words, Moses was the shadow that arrived before the real thing got there. That's what a foreshadow is. Are we tracking? Kind of logical. I know it's blowing your mind, but you stand, the sun behind you, you have a shadow in front of you. Your shadow gets places before you do. Moses was a foreshadow. He came on the scene representing and a shadow of an image of what was really coming later. Jesus, don't miss this, is our intercessor. Jesus stands in the presence of God at the right hand, interceding and praying for you and me. Jesus is at the right hand. He doesn't live in your heart. The Holy Spirit lives in your heart. Jesus sits at the right hand of God, praying for you, interceding for you. What does that mean? That means Jesus is sitting next to God and be like, yeah, I know I, I paid for that sin too. Yeah, 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 I know they're a child of God. They believe in me. They're following me. Yeah, God, they're okay. He's in there interceding for us. This is why we can be in God's presence with boldness and confidence in what Paul told us in 2 Corinthians, that we can come boldly into the presence of God. Why? Because Jesus is our intercessor saying, yep, they get to come too. Yep, they get to come on too. Yeah, they can come stand face to face. They get the presence of God. They get the spirit of God. They get to become the radiant people of God. They get to come and be in your presence because Jesus is our intercessor. So what is this glory of God? What is this glory that Moses said, God, show me your glory? <laughs> And Paul was saying, we get to behold the glory of God and radiate the glory of God. What is this glory? I believe that the glory of God is the eminent expression of God's goodness. Of his goodness. God, Moses said, God, show us your glory. Show us what you're famous for. And God's like, mm, I'll let you experience my goodness. Now, let's take it a step further. I believe that God's goodness is seen in his forgiveness for us. I, I, let's take it another step for, further. God's forgiveness makes room for his favor. God's goodness is seen in his forgiveness. His forgiveness makes room for his favor. And God's favor is the Holy Spirit's presence in your life and my life. Isn't that what... what his prayer was, God, let me know your ways that I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. What is the favor of God? Well, it's not upward mobility. It's not more financial blessing. It's not you doing better than someone else is doing. It's not you getting to cut the line and it being okay. It's not you getting to be permissive in your sin and somebody else being judged for the sin. That's not the favor of God. The favor of God is on the fact that he allows his presence to come and live on the inside of you and he doesn't take it away from you. God, how will they know that you are with us? How will they know, God, that we are your people? This is what Moses was crying out for. And God says, you know, you want to know how they're going to know? He was begging God, God, make your presence come with us. Because if your presence isn't among us, what makes us any different than any other social club on a Sunday morning? If God's presence doesn't show up in our midst, what makes this different than any other Rotary Civic Club that you would attend that's trying to better the life of the people around them in their world? What sets the church apart from any other gathering that you would attend throughout the week? You want to know what it is? God's presence comes among us. And we 
get to behold the presence of God here. We daily get to experience the presence of God in our lives. And we get to radiate the life of God. And the more we are in the presence of God, the more the life of God radiates from our lives. You want to know why you don't radiate very much? Because you haven't developed a practice of meeting with God face to face yet. This was Moses' practice, to meet with God face to face, to come and behold the very power and presence of God and he got to take God's presence with him. You get to take God's presence with you. When we talk about the presence of God, we theologically there's something called the omnipresence of God. That's the understanding that God is everywhere all the time. He's never not present. He's always present. God is aware and present everywhere. He has omnipresence. He has abiding presence. His abiding presence is the Holy Spirit who lives on the inside of every believer and follower of Jesus. His spirit abides in you. He tabernacles in you. He is in you. His presence is in you. Oswald Chambers says it like this. Sanctification is not drawing from Jesus the power to be holy. It is drawing from Jesus the holiness that was manifested in him and he manifests it in us. Sanctification is an impartation, not an imitation. In other words, when you came to Jesus, he imparted and gave you his Holy Spirit to live on the inside of you. There is an abiding presence. God goes with you everywhere you go because his spirit is in you. Oh, but there's a third kind of presence that the Bible talks about. And that is the manifest presence. When something tangible and different occurs... Because the people of God gather together with the purpose of beholding and exalting and worshiping and honoring and welcoming God himself. It's the manifest presence. It's, it's the thing that happens when you're in the room on a Sunday and water starts coming from your eyes and you don't know why. It's, it's what, what, when you walk into the room and all of a sudden something in your heart brings a sense of peace that you haven't experienced all week long. It's, it's the moment where you come into the presence and you're all of a sudden okay and, and there's something that is stirring and provoking and, and occurring within you and you are, there's something that is happening almost tangibly in our midst. It's the manifest presence. Shows up in different ways. Oh, but we can experience the manifest presence of God. Why? Because God promises to come where he's wanted. God comes where he's worshipped. God comes where the people of God come and say, we're going to go to our own tent of meeting and meet with the Lord face to face. The presence of God comes and fills a space where you decide to offer praise to God. Where you decide to offer a sacrifice of praise to God. This last week I told you that we need to rejoice, that we need to crank up our worship. Friday I was kind of feeling, Ugh. it's the most theological explanation I can give you. I was feeling on Friday. And in my house, no one else was around. Cranked up some music. And I offered God a sacrifice of praise. I sacrificed some of my dignity, even though nobody was around to see me, I saw me. <laughs> and you know what I did? I just started jumping before the Lord. 
just worshiping God. Come on, Jesus. It's a good day. It's an awesome day. God, I can be in your presence. And I started to sing, and I started to worship, and I started to twirl, because why not? At that point, come on, I am offering a sacrifice of praise. I'm killing my flesh, saying, God, you're worthy of all praise. You are high and lifted up. You're exalted. The train of your robe can fill my temple. God, I want to behold you face to face. And the atmosphere in my attitude shifted. Because when God walks in a room, it changes the atmosphere. You want to behold the glory of God in a way that transforms your life to where the haters around you can't deny that the Spirit of God is shifting something in you? Become a person of worship that gets into the presence of God and beholds and honors and glorifies the king. This week, make Moses' prayer your prayer. Lord, let me know your ways so may I, so I may understand you more fully. Take the veil away, God, so I can see and understand. And that I may continue to enjoy your favor, your presence. God, that's my prayer today. That's our prayer today. God, let us know you more fully. And may we continue to enjoy your presence. When we're moving from meeting to meeting, classroom to classroom, appointment to appointment, dinner to the dishes, God, let me worship you and behold your presence and know you're with me. And among me, Lord, may I be a radiant person that shines the life of God. Not because I'm special, but because I'm spending time face to face worshiping and adoring you, my good God. Would you stand with me? You don't have to have a band. You don't have to have music. You don't have to have lyrics to worship God, to come face to face with God, to acknowledge that he's there and to invite him to come near. You don't need any of those things. You just need a willing vessel to say, Lord, let me know you more fully that I may experience your favor more, that I may experience your presence more. I wonder if maybe that's your prayer today. Would you bow your heads? Would you just begin to pray that? Lord, would you show me your glory more? Show me your favor more. Show me your presence more. Show me your understanding more. Would you just begin to cry out right now to the Lord? What is your prayer? What is your worship? What is your admonition? What is it you long for? Where do you need to see the glory and the radiance of God show up in your own space, in your own life? Jesus, would you show us your face? Show us your glory, your spirit's power. God, we want to come and behold you and worship you and exalt you. So, Lord, be exalted. Be exalted in this place. Be exalted, O Lord. Be exalted here. Be lifted high. Lord, your goodness is available to us. God, we want to be people who radiate the life of God by becoming people who get into the presence of God and see you face to face. So we can come boldly to see you face to face today. Lord, would you fill this room right now? Lord, come into the hearts and the lives where you're wanted. Come into the hearts and the lives, God, that welcomes you and wants you. Jesus, we welcome you here. Lord, we just want to take a minute and bask in the reality that you're here with us. Thank you, Father. 
If you don't know what to say, just say, Jesus, I love you. If you don't know what to say, just say, Jesus, be exalted. If you don't know what else to say, say, Jesus, thank you for your, for your goodness and your forgiveness. Lord, we behold you today. Hallelujah. Lord, when you walk in a room, things change. Lord, I thank you for the person in the room or watching online that's got a pinched nerve in their neck. Lord, that you're healing that right now in your powerful name. Lord, I pray for the one who's been crying out for something, Lord, in desperation. Lord, I pray that you're meeting with them right now. Lord, you know their prayers of desperation and you're meeting them here in this place. Lord, I thank you for the person who's got a hurt Achilles heel, Lord, that you're healing that right now in Jesus' name. Jesus, when you walk in a room, things change. Sickness is healed. Brokenness is mended. Lives are made whole by your salvation work. Lord, I thank you for those who have been down this week that there would be a, an uptick of joy as they get into your presence this week and meet with you face to face. Jesus, we love you. We welcome you here. May our hearts and our lives and our homes be tents of meeting where it would be our practice to meet with you personally, face to face. To just take moments of turning our attention and our affection to the fact that you're here with us. It's an act of faith. It's an act outside of our comfort. But Lord, it's a demonstration of an embodied life believing that you come where you're wanted. So Lord, we make room and we do actions to let you know that you're welcome here in our hearts, in our homes, in our lives, in our cars. We thank you for it. Come on, somebody take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. One more time in and out. Thank you, Lord, for the breath in our lungs. It's a gift from you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Come on, and everybody said... Amen. Hey, would you say this with us? Let's speak blessing over one another, the family, the body of Christ. Here it is. Ready? Go. Let's read it. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Amen. Hey, everywhere you go, may you know that you're loved by God. Go in God's grace and peace. If you need prayer, we're available. We love you. You're dismissed. I really hope today's message was life-giving. As a church, we want to help you encounter God and take another next step in your allegiance to Jesus. I want to ask you to take a step right now, in fact. Would you just share this message with a friend? Maybe post it on your social, text a coworker the link. Just be sure to include something that you learned or how it impacted you personally. When you do that, you get to be a part of seeing faith come to life in someone else. And don't forget to visit our central hub, faithchurchks.org. You'll find other next steps that you can take in your faith, including giving and partnership with us as we help others encounter Jesus like you've encountered him. Hey, we love you. And until we get to hang out again, remember, don't shrink back from your faithful allegiance to King Jesus.